Yeah, it's Angelo Seven. It's Paul. Uh, I live in Mountain View. I uh, pastor at a church called Peninsula Bible Church in Palo Alto. Got five teenage kids, which is why I'm here. <laughs> Not at home. No, actually, I uh, I love my family, and uh, it's a it's a cost to be here, but I but I I'm excited to be with you guys. Um, well, let me tell you a story about my family life. Friday nights are movie nights at our family. So tonight, we'll go home and watch a movie. Usually how it starts is that we make homemade pizza, and we sit down, we each get our pizza on our plates, and we sit down on the couch, get everything arranged, and then I say the magic words. Alexa, turn on family dim. <laughs> and all the lights go dark. We finish our pizza, and then, then we can actually get in real theater mode, and I say again, Alexa, turn on family dark and everything goes black, and we watch our movie. And then, of course, the movie's over, and the credits roll, and then I speak one final time, and I say, Alexa, turn on Family Bright, and all the lights come on. Actually, we've since replaced our Alexa with a Google Home, so that's appropriate. <laughs> so now it's OK, Google, turn on. But, you know, the, the principle's the same. Now, here's the thing. At one point, I realized what I was doing, and it really struck me. I was calling forth light and darkness with the power of my voice. Does that sound familiar? I realized that that is the very first recorded act in the Hebrew scriptures that the Creator did. Genesis 1, 3. And God said, let there be light, Alexa. <laughs> There was light. Now I realized something else about that that moment is that I really liked being able to control my lights with my voice. It gave me a sense of, of power that I didn't have before. It kind of felt like it almost like awakened something within me. And I started to wonder, was that good or bad? Now, in reality, this uh, newfound power, this godlike ability to verbally summon light. It wasn't all that new. In fact, it's the latest progression in a series that's been taking place over the last several hundred years. See, around 1650, we started really building technology. We started with machines. Machines allowed us to do more than we could do by hand. So, for instance, in 1764, James Hargreaves invented the spinning jenny. It sounds like a girl I used to know in college, but it's, it's not. It's a, it's a machine that allowed one person to weave on eight different looms simultaneously. Future versions upped that number to 120 looms, and then we built whole textile factories. See, machines allowed us to do things that we couldn't do before. Our technology gave us more power. But then things started changing. Around 1850, we started focusing our technology on transportation and telecommunication. So the very first, one of the very first telegraph messages was sent 44 miles from Washington, DC to a depot in Baltimore. And the message that was sent was, what hath God wrong? 50 years later, the Wright brothers would fly four times successfully through the air. And 10 years after that, the first commercial airline was born. See, now technology was allowing us to be places we couldn't be before, either virtually or by traveling there at great speeds. And so now our technology was giving us presence. Around 1950, we started focusing on computers and networking. The first computer filled a room that was larger than the space that I live with my five children. 50 tons. And of course, as computers shrank, the amount of data that we generated grew. We could process data, we could store data, we could compute it, we could understand it. Now we have these huge amounts of data. In, our, in a 2018, IDC estimated that there's 18 zettabytes of data to be collected. Now, if you don't know the scale, that's you know roughly a thousand megabyte, gigabyte, petabyte, terabyte. Exabyte, zettabyte, 18 of those. That's a lot of data. So our technology 
has allowed us to know things that we didn't know before. Our technology has given us more knowledge. Now in seminary, I took a class on theology. And they told us that theologians always characterize God using three main attributes. You can probably guess what they are. God is all-powerful or omnipotent. God is everywhere or omnipresent. God is all-knowing or omniscient. Those are the three classical attributes of God. So over the last several hundred years, we've been becoming more and more like God. Our technology has made us more powerful, more present, more knowledgeable. And the question that I started to ask is, are we becoming gods? Is our technology somehow giving us a sense of deity? Now, this, uh, this question started to bother me. Because if we're becoming godlike, then the question that worried me was, what's happening to our humanity? In a recent event that allthingsnew.tech hosted, uh, author Andy Crouch told this story about a farmer he knew. This farmer operated a large industrial farm, and he had these, these great tractors. It's basically a self-driving tractor, which sounds really cool. So you just program in the, the GPS coordinates, and the tractor plows the field. So Andy asked the farmer, well, what do you do with your time? Because you still have to sit in the cab. It's not a fully self-driving tractor. He says, a lot of time I like to read, but says, what I really like to do is play Farmville. <laughs> Is it, isn't there something wrong with that? In December, my wife and I will celebrate our 20th year of marriage. Very excited. And uh, I can think back and I can remember how excited I was 20 years ago to get married. Excited about a lot of things, but one of them was at night to say goodnight to my best friend. And in the morning for the first thing to do would be to say good morning to my best friend. I just didn't realize that would be a Samsung phone. <laughs> I thought it'd be my wife. A study in 2018 said that um, using their phones for most couples is more popular than having sex in bed. So my smartphone makes me feel, my smart home makes me feel like a god. History has been moving us along this path. We prefer virtual farming to real. We, we relate more to our phones than our spouses. So we're gaining these powers, but are we losing something as well? Are we losing our humanity? Now, here's the problem. The question I've been asking is, is my technology destroying my humanity? I started thinking about that question, and, and it bothered me, not just for myself, not just for the world, but because of the area we live in. I'm a pastor in the Silicon Valley. And so the question I started wondering was, if technology is destroying humanity, whose fault is it? Well, it's not mine. I'm just a pastor, right? <laughs> it's ours. Yes. We're here. We're the ones driving this massive cultural change. And so the better and harder question to ask is, are we building technology that's destroying humanity? A friend of mine used to work for IBM Research Center back in the 90s. And he told me the story as I started asking these questions about a time when he was writing an API that transferred information from one business group to another. He was an engineer. And uh, you know, you could set all these configuration flags about which parts of data were included in the, tra in the transfer or not. And he realized that he was going to provide a bunch of parameters for which data to include. But by setting the defaults, he would be essentially deciding how about 80% of his customers used this API. And he also realized that some of those bits of information were sensitive. And so essentially, he was making ethical choices on behalf of his customers by setting the default behavior of this low-level API. So he went to his bosses, and he said, you know, I, I don't know how to make these decisions. How do I decide what to do? He said they thought for a moment. I looked at him and said, Rob, do the right thing. <laughs> That was it. That was all they gave him. And he said, that's the problem. I don't know what the right thing to do is. And so he said this. I love this phrase. He said, I realized then that I don't know enough theology. I don't know enough theology to be a good engineer. 
And Rob left his tech job and went to seminary. <laughs> and unfortunately, he never made it back into tech. It's questions like that that two years ago I started asking, and a group of us formed this uh, effort called All Things New Tech to say, what if there are questions we're not asking? What if there are things that we're not thinking about? And what's the responsibility of Christians in the Bay Area, in Silicon Valley, to affect our world positively through the technology we create? You ever feel like the problems you're solving professionally don't really need to be solved? Or maybe that, even worse, maybe you're making more problems down the road by solving problems that customers want. I had those kinds of feelings when I was a product manager for Oracle. I worked for Oracle for seven years as a product manager on an inventory system. And that was one of the reasons why I left, went to seminary, and became a pastor. So the net result of this talk is leave your jobs, go to seminary. That's, <laughs> that's it. That's the only thing I do. No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I think there are some questions that we can ask about how we build and create technology. Mm -hmm. And these are the questions that I've been trying to ask technologists, trying to just stir some things up and, and explore. Is there a different way to do things? So the question I've been asking is, how can you create technology which restores humanity? Now, if you ask that question, the only way to answer it is by starting with some cohesive vision of what humanity is. If, if you don't have a vision of what it means to be human, how do you make sure that you preserve it? So I like to characterize humanity with four different relationships. So we exist towards God in dependence. We exist towards the rest of the creation in authority. We exist to ourselves in awareness. And we exist with others in mutual love. I think that's how... God designed humanity to operate. And there's a lot more behind that, but for now, that's kind of a summary. The problem is that technology has an incredible ability to disrupt each of those four areas. The power we get through technology means that we think that we are no longer dependent on anything. Because of our technology, we don't have the silence space to have any kind of self-awareness. Other people become avatars in our lives, caricatures, which makes love impossible. And we either abuse our authority over the creation or we disconnect from it entirely, playing Farmville in our tractors. But technology isn't the problem. The problem lies within our hearts. So if technology didn't cause those problems, the question is, is it possible then to create technology which helps to restore each of those four relationships rather than to disrupt it? I think it is. But how do we get there? How do we build tech which restores humanity? I think you've heard some of those stories today already. But let me offer three simple suggestions. First, you have to start with yourself. You can't help to restore others' humanity if your own is compromised. If we're spiritual beings, then we have to find rhythms and patterns and boundaries for how we use technology that affirm our spiritual lives. I call this digital spiritual disciplines, and that's probably a whole other talk or a retreat or something. But we have to figure out how we can use tech for ourselves in a way that supports those relationships. Once you get there, which that's a huge journey, then you can start asking questions. What about my work? What about the things that I'm doing at work? Now, the thing about Silicon Valley is that I, I think a lot of the workplaces around here are really a democracy of ideas. No matter where you are in the org chart, people listen. People have the ability to raise issues. And it might be as simple as just asking the right questions. I don't even think you have to have answers. But ask the questions that other people aren't asking. 
See where it leads. Are we creating tech that hurts people's humanity? The interesting thing about that question I found is that everybody's concerned about that. Everybody agrees that this is a danger. So here's where Christians can find their voice to say, I actually have a vision for humanity that's compelling, beautiful. Can we build tech that aligns with that? You know that feeling that uh, you have when you're standing at the Grand Canyon? You're probably with friends or family. You're, you're in this amazingly beautiful place. You're connected to the earth. You feel small amidst the grandeur of what you're looking at. A friend of mine, Andrew LaFoon, is the CEO of a company called Mixbook. And he says that his goal for their company, they, they help people make photo books. And what he wants to do is help people to capture those moments, to make something physical that reminds you of an experience. But that physical thing is a collaborative effort, so people join to make that. And then as you have that, you're remembering what you experienced. That's building, that's using technology to restore humanity. And you see how that technology restores all of those four relationships. You have a sense of your dependence. You have a sense of awareness and memory. You have a sense of community and building it. You have a sense of your relationship to the earth. It's amazing. It's possible. So ask those questions. But finally, don't do it alone. Involve others. Form a group. Gather other technologists. Have talks in groups like this. This is what we're trying to do at all things new.tech is try to just create conversation. Just get people asking questions. Because I've talked to people that have been in tech, Christians that have been in tech for years, and they said, I've never thought about how my faith affects the actual technology I create. Sure, it affects how I relate to my coworkers, how I interact with people, but the fact that my spiritual life would affect the technical decisions I make never crossed their minds. Form groups. Ask those questions. If you want to join up with some of the stuff we're doing, we're always looking for people to help create, foster conversations. Go to our website, allthingsnew.tech slash join, and you can fill out a form. We'll, we'll get in touch with you. But do this together, because I think my friend was right. I don't think any of us have enough theology to be good engineers. But together, I think we do. This is the kind of thing that requires collaboration. So you can't change the world. We're not going to save a process that's been going on for hundreds of years. But we can start with ourselves. We can build digital habits. We can ask questions that no one else is asking. And we can involve others in a community to explore that. And the next time that you control the lights with the power of your voice, mm -hmm. Remember that you are not a god. You are human. And it is a beautiful thing to be human. A stunning creation of God. And if you work in the tech industry, if you live here, if you have any influence, you can be a part of building technology that retains and restores our humanity. Amen. Thanks.